Four. So now let's move to um, to the to images and lo and behold, here is one image for okay. This is in a matrix form. Uh, so these are simply the values of the samples, and because we use eight bit uh, encoding of uh, uh, of intensity by right, of the pixel. Uh, they range between 0 and 255. Okay, uh, where does this come from? This comes from, from the most famous image that uh, is used in image processing. Anyone knows what's the image that they always, image people always use? Mona Lisa. Hmm? Close, not Mona Lisa, but a Playboy, uh, oops. <laughs> Let's see, do I have Lana here somewhere? Oh, shoot, I erased my Lana. Okay, this is the eye, Lana's eye. And uh, I don't have a clue where she disappeared. Maybe she doesn't like me, so she got away. Okay, so this is, uh, so how does JPEG proceed? JPEG breaks the image in <coughs> eight by eight squares. <coughs> now it uses the following fact. If the image is not just white noise, there should be only a few kind of periodic regularities in that image. So what JPEG does, it does a 2D version of the discrete cosine transform. And 2D version of discrete cosine transform is just the tensor product of the one dimensional medical uh, variables separate. Um, so it's simply you multiply pixels with the product, or essentially think of these as kind of slightly twisted roots of unity, right? Uh, but you see, uh, U component and uh, actually here it's K and M are <coughs> independent. They are just product of the cosines. Uh, so in fact, you can compute the discrete Fourier transform by computing discrete Fourier transform along each dimension and then so you do all the columns, discrete Fourier transform, and then you transform the columns. Uh, you go horizontally and uh, uh, find the discrete Fourier uh, transform um, row wise. So this is what you. Oops. Oh man, what is how it comes? I didn't. Ah, okay. So now. Why are we doing so? This is now the tricky part. Okay. Here, these eight by eight little pieces of picture, we represent them as a discrete by the, their discrete Fourier transform. What would be the meaning of that? Well, you know. This would be spatial frequencies. And essentially, the reason why every spatial frequency can be decomposed in sine waves is the completeness of the base. But this does have intuitive explanation because it looks at kind of regular patterns of different frequencies. And the idea is that only a few of them should be significant if the picture is not just noise. So, uh, but discrete cosine transform, the cosine goes between minus one and one. So in order to um, utilize it in a parsimonious way, you shift the image by subtracting half the range, which is 128. Now some pixels will be positive and some pixels will be negative. 
here and there are mostly negative, but there are a few positive ones. So, so v, the V kind of shift the signal to make it uh, between minus 128 to 127. Okay. Then we take the discrete Fourier transform. Right? And as I mentioned, we can do it uh, coordinate wise. And uh, then we invert it. And if you look at the, uh, oops, what happens here? It was unhappy with something. What is the something? A. Oh, I didn't initialize where my A is. Ah, here. Sorry about that. So because of the DC component goes with a factor one half, uh, we have to add these factors here. So this is AI is one, except at zero and it's one half. And you take the inverse transform and lo and behold, you get precisely what you started from. But now let's do the compression. Now, how do we do the compression? That now comes where, where psychology comes into the play. Just like your ears, your ears are not equally sensitive for all frequencies, for all pitch. We can hear between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. But we evolved to hear the best in what range? What do you think? The range is about 500 hertz to about 3,000 hertz. Why is this range important? Voice. Voice. We evolved our ears are tuned. I guess we stopped worrying about lions chasing us, right? And we just want to hear our insults that we uh, So, uh, in the same way, your eyes are not equally sensitive for all spatial frequencies. For example, if you have a white shirt, right? And then, as it happens to me quite often, you get some ketchup on it. No? It will look horrible. But if you have a busy shirt and you get some ketchup, it won't look that bad at all. The point is that if something is low frequency, then you can detect quite minuscule changes of illumination. But if something is, for example, an edge, near the edge, if something involves high frequencies, uh, then the sensitivity for the change of level is much, much smaller. Now, MP3 encodes the audio frequencies according to psychoacoustics, which involves also according to a, a, a table that, it, that quantifies the acuity of hearing at that frequency. Right? Here, instead, you have a table that is empirically obtained, um, and uh, it looks like this. Here it is. This is a table, smaller the number, more accurate you can see the changes in this frequency. And you can see even horizontal and vertical is not the same. Uh, I guess we are more sensitive to horizontal changes than vertical changes. Um, and here, uh, at the very last end, when both frequencies are high, the sensitivity is much, much smaller, about 10 times as uh, uh, smaller than the sensitivity here. So what you do now, you divide the discrete Fourier transform by point wise by this matrix, right? And you round it off, okay? So you can see now what this looks like. And look, 
most of the frequencies are gone because they are too small. No artifacts, very little artifacts have been introduced. So when you divide this ED by this matrix, this is what you get. And this is what JPEG encodes. How does it encode it? It encodes it using Cantor's snake, which means you start from this border, uh, this border, and then you zigzag, right? And at the end, uh, uh, you uh, encode the zeros by what's called zero run. Simply count how many zeros there are. And then Huffman coding is applied uh, to this. But notice fundamental feature is that only a few frequencies were encoded. If you did the same with the discrete Fourier transform, it would be a disaster because actually there would be many, many more reasonably large coefficients. Okay, so now if you want to decode back, what do you do? Well, you simply multiply back with the matrix Q, right? You divided it with matrix Q, now you multiply with matrix Q, then you take the inverse um, uh, discrete Fourier transform and uh, you look at the matrix that you obtain. Now let's see how far, uh, so this matrix is still shifted, we have to add the 128 that we subtracted and lo and behold this is what you get. And let's compare it uh, with the original matrix. So here is now 52, uh, here is 55, 47, 55, and so forth. If you subtract the original image from the new image, these are the errors that you incur. So this should be compared with a scale that goes from 0 to 255. And if you can see here the errors are smaller, here the errors are bigger in general, but they are on high frequencies where you are less likely to notice them. Um, so, what does the error look like? Well, uh, if you subtract, uh, let me see, uh, image and this, this, and then uh, if we subtract, uh, this is, uh, no, no, sorry, this is the original versus uh, um, image size. So this is the original. This is what you get back after horrendous compression. Right? After really, really uh, very big compression. And you can see it looks pretty close. Let's see the error. If you look at the error, on the scale from 0 to 255, the error looks completely blank. Because it is small. Uh, too small for you to notice. Let's multiply it, let's uh, amplify the error by two. You can kind of barely start noticing that there is something there, not in the projector. So let's multiply it by four. Uh, if you multiply it by four, you can kind of start seeing uh, where the errors are. And if you, oh, you have to multiply by eight to actually <coughs> see the distribution of the error, right? <laughs> so now, so what is the moral 
for, from JPEG that I want you to take. But you want to build a model of 8 by 8 picture. Your idea is uh, that only a few, if it's not white noise, only a few spatial frequencies are significant. Uh, so you use discrete Fourier transform because discrete Fourier transform will introduce very little low amplitude artifacts, uh, which after the quantization will be dropped. Right? So your model is uh, sufficiently good for all practical purposes, but it is not too good. Because if it's too good, it's computationally too important to uh, taxing, and the compression rate might not be the same. One of the main artifacts of JPEG is blockiness. Namely, each block, 8 by 8, is processed separately. So, on, if the compression is aggressive, uh, if you want to obtain an image that is like a tenth of the original size, uh, then you can kind of see that this 8 by 8 boxes kind of start emerging. Uh, and this was one of the main reasons uh, why around 2000, People decided we have more powerful mathematics, so let us use wavelengths. <clears throat> you can see later uh, what wavelengths are. Um, and uh, lo and behold, uh, the compression lab for the same compression level, for some pictures, the effect, the visual effect was more pleasing because the blockiness was gone. But then, <coughs> some bastard figured out how to remove the blockiness. It turns out that the blockiness completely comes from abrupt changes in the DC component. Okay. So what you can then tweak JPEG in which you will not use a fixed DC component, but you take an interpolation surface that is determined by, say, three or four points, three points, you can just use the plane. So the idea is uh, your DC component is no longer DC, but kind of gradually changes from the center of one 8 by 8 blocks to the center of one below and above. And lo and behold, the blockiness is gone with minimal computational, uh, or additional computational cost. And guess what? Now, David Dalton, who is a foremost expert on JPEG 2000, in fact, I think it was part of his thesis, uh, he would kill me for the statement that I'm going to make, but just look at the cameras. Uh, none whatsoever uses JPEG 2000. But why is it so? Well, it is true that in general, JPEG 2000 produces less art. But it's computationally much costlier than the simple DCT. And the return is not commensurate. So this is what I meant when I say yeah, you build a model that is good enough for your purpose, but you don't do overkill because any overkill has a cost associated. And in fact, uh, JPEG is a brilliant example of how to strike a balance uh, between, uh, uh, between uh, quality of the model 
and computational cost uh, of the model. Now, um, how is then uh, the, when you transmit JPEG, let me show you the, here it is, uh, usually only the DC component, where is it, uh, here, only the DC component is large. And uh, DC component tends to change uh, less rapidly, of course, than <coughs> high frequencies. Uh, so when you encode this, uh, DC components are encoded separately, and they are encoded by uh, a differential schema in which you give the value for the first square, and then for the subsequent squares, both to the left, sorry, to the right and to the bottom, you only encode the difference between the new value and the previous value. Because these differences tend to be much smaller than uh, the value itself. itself. So, you do, you get an extra saving there. Uh, after you have done uh, the whole image, then you apply uh, usually Huffman encoding, or in fact, it's not specified into the JPEG standard, or arithmetic encoding. Arithmetic encoding is a little bit tighter, produces files that are about 10 to 15 percent smaller, but it is much more expensive than the Huffman uh, encoding. So most of the uh, most of the implementations of JPEG actually use uh, 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 use Huffman encoding rather than uh, arithmetical encoding. But so this is the story of. JPEG. So I urge you at home, uh, look, everything is now multimedia, right? So um, it's, it's, you know, if you are coding something and there is JPEG involved and you have to debug something, if you understand it, things will really work smoothly. Uh, and it's, as you can see, this is all relatively simple, but extremely efficient. Uh, so please read this file, run it, and uh, uh, make sure you understand uh, all of the aspects of, uh, of JPEG. Uh, any questions about this? Yes? Initially, why did we do to double Sorry? Okay, very good. You see, when you double the, you double the sample size because you make the mirror image. But this mirror image, when you rotate it, it becomes anti-symmetric. What's on the left is simply minus what's centrally symmetric. So you don't have to encode. But rather than seeing it that way, this is to explain to you why discrete cosine transforming is gentle. Why it doesn't introduce artifacts. But in practice, we don't do this flipping and rotations. We simply use a different orthonormal base, basis, which is the slightly rotated basis. So it's not, you can see here, it's not the roots of unity, powers of the roots of unity, but there is also uh, j plus one half. But notice here, um, the, after you do that, you will get only uh, the one half of the values will be um, uh, will be small. So 
once you cancel out, sorry, uh, will be different. So once you cancel out the imaginary uh, part uh, and you take, so here will be one cosine and here the same cosine from the complex conjugate. So you get two of them and lo and behold, uh, this is why, uh, uh, but notice here we go only between 0 and n minus 1. So the size of the transform is exactly n, but it's hard to see why using that transform. But the reason for this is, uh, in fact, in signal processing textbooks, they just give you the formulas. So it's a few monkeys. Like you are not capable of just memorize formulas. So, um, um, but if you see it in a way with flipping, then you can understand why the uh, high frequencies don't uh, leak in, right? Why don't we just use the word? If we do, if in practice, I mean, when you apply it, you use just this. Uh, but we showed that using this is equivalent to the business with flipping. And in the business with flipping, you can see why there are no artifacts. Because when you flip, what you get will have left end and right end perfectly matched. So there will be no jumps. So we set up using Can you just use the original? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you use. Uh, uh, exactly, so you use only uh, as many as you have uh, sampling points. That's right. Right, because uh, once you do the rotation, if you flip and you do rotation, uh, you flip, you take the Fourier transform and you rotate it. When you cancel out the imaginary parts, you get uh, precisely this uh, that is of size or of original size. It's no longer that. Right? But as I say, it's hard to see. I mean, it's really kind of mysterious if I just showed you this and told you this guy doesn't produce artifacts unlike the discrete Fourier transform. Why? Well, the business with flipping explains why there are no, uh, there are no artifacts. So, yes? Um, if there's a, a com composite of a uh, wavelength, a frequency that is not the uh, two to the power of something, that means we can never exactly capture that. We just use the two to the power of wave to approximate it. Yes, so this is why. So the question is um, if the fre spatial frequency is not precisely uh, the beam size, is multiple of the beam sizes, lo and behold, you can see here, this should have been only two peaks. But because the frequency is in between, you need several of them to interact with each other to produce something that looks like a single frequency, but in between. Right? Any other questions? Yes? Uh, I said, why do you need to uh, multiply some by half of the very start? So we say it again. Uh, for the inverse uh, cosine transform, mm -hmm. we're multiplying the first one in each row of color by a half, and it's the same for one dimensional x. Why do we do that? You are saying, sorry, I don't know. Um, on the inverse cosine transform, mm -hmm. uh, we're multiplying the first one by a half. Yes. Uh, why do we do that? OK, the reason for that is that uh, Everything bar except the DC component has positive frequency and negative frequency that get summed up, but the guy in the center is only one. So you can see the same thing happens, you know, when you do Fourier series, uh, uh, which is what we are going to do next. Uh, Fourier series is, uh, so what is, let's uh, uh, quickly,
it's the same reason it's kind of to have a uniform uh, formula so if you do if you have a periodic function uh, this is how you write it it's uh, one half a zero plus sum k equals from uh, one to infinity a i cosine k t uh, ah, sorry uh, a k cosine k t plus p k uh, sine k t and so the reason is uh, uh, exactly the same uh, because when you do it in terms of complex exponentials, if you do it like this, then this results into sum k equals from minus infinity to infinity ck e to the i k omega. Uh, and to, in order to have unified uh, formulas, uh, uh, you have uh, one half. We will, you will see that uh, in uh, um, uh, next class. Okay, so now, so here we have discrete samples and finitely many of them. Uh, but, and this is, uh, you know, the discrete Fourier transform is a periodic uh, function. Uh, now, what we want to see next uh, is uh, how the discrete Fourier transform compare with the, the continuous time Fourier, uh, the, the Fourier series, right? And uh, we will see um, how it compares uh, with the uh, uh, honest to God Fourier transform of uh, unlimited functions in which uh, the frequencies uh, um, are between uh, minus pi and pi. And uh, this is an example of something really strange. Uh, that all of these calculations uh, have continuous counterpart uh, in which summation is replaced by integration. And why is this so? To be honest, the only answer for this is God is great. <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, that uh, uh, it turns out that uh, uh, a large number of discrete concepts when it comes to representation uh, in orthogonal basis uh, have completely analog uh, for continuous time and it doesn't apply just to cosines uh, and sines but it also applies for example to sample orthogonal polynomials namely uh, for example Jupiter uh, polynomials okay you know what let's finish a bit early today yeah. Uh, because this is a good place to stop. Uh, next time we are going to go, uh, try to read the, it's called, I think, for control system. So we will very quickly go over uh, Fourier, uh, sorry, over um, Fourier series. Uh, and because we want to see how the discrete Fourier transform fits uh, in comparison to um, continuous time for year yes, series, something important happens, namely aliasing. Uh, so we will look at that, and then we are moving to uh, representation of continuous time signals, uh, such as, uh, you know, audio signals, for example, and uh, how we process them. So there will be a little bit of math, but uh, if you keep up, uh, it's going to you are going to be really fine.